Howard, how are we doing, man? Craig, good to talk to you. How are you? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm excited to talk about a little basketball. I feel like I've been in an NFL draft wormhole uh, the last four months, and the Wizards have not given us much to talk about. Uh, so now I emerge from that wormhole. I get to talk playoffs. It's a uh, it's a good day. And you know, Sixers and Knicks certainly gave us a lot of entertainment last night. I'm going to ask you the most sports radio y of questions. But as you watch that game last night, is that a Sixers found a way to win it, or is that the kind of thing where if you're the Knicks, you're like, damn, we we blew that. I mean, there those things are always going to go hand in hand, and we make these, um, you know, possibly shallow-ish judgments or just based on our own impressions sometimes. Like, did they take it from them? Like, oh, sure. Like, you can always – every team that loses a game like that is going to point to, well, we shouldn't have fouled here, or maybe we had a slow rotation, or we shouldn't have put this guy in at this time. We should have called this time. And, like, it's always true, right? Like, there's always – the team that loses is always going to feel like there's something they could have done to prevent it. And they're probably right, especially when it's two teams that are, I think, as closely matched in a series that's as closely matched as this one. Like these teams are, are, are very, very close. I think in large part because Embiid's not himself, right? hundred percent Embiid would cha- would tip the balance between these two teams. Of course, the Knicks could counter that, uh, you know, if they had Julius Randle and they were closer to hundred percent, maybe they're better. Um, but in terms of that game last night, and by the way, I should just note, you know how close this series is? The Sixers have a cumulative uh, advantage of two points through five games. Like, that's the the, uh, the cumulative scores plus two for the Sixers over five games. It's insane. I think I'm going to lean Sixers took it just because of the kinds of shots that it required for uh, Tyrese Maxey specifically to make. Um, the degree of difficulty, the timing, the clutchness, uh, all of it. And, uh, like, he has just had – I don't want to say it's a revelation because, like, he's been – bursting into stardom over the last you know year plus but the postseason is always bigger and and the gravity of, of those shots is, is just that much higher and I, I just think that that was Maxie's night ultimately that's how I'll remember that game was what Tyrese Maxie did to the Knicks less so than what the Knicks might have have done to allow it no I I'm 100% with you and I think last year during the playoffs especially you watch Maxie and you're just like this guy's way better than I think we all are thinking that he is. At least people that were checking in, uh, maybe on the Sixers, that don't watch them with frequency. But as you talk to people around the league and maybe even folks within the Sixers, like when did they realize that they had not just like, oh, hey, we got a, a later draft pick that isn't bad. We got someone who's like top three player on a championship team level good. <laughs> um. You know, it's hard to know with these things, right? Like, I think about it through the lens of, like, Jokic, too, right, where the Nuggets draft him in the second round and, you know, was like, oh, let's take a, you know, let's take a, a, a flyer on this guy. And, like, when do you know? Like, I think the teams know when the rest of us know, <laughs> usually. It's like there's like, – sometimes it's, a, sometimes it's, a, it's a, a, a brief flash, or like a, there's a game or a practice or whatever where you start to see a guy really make a leap – before it's evident to the rest of the world. I don't know that that happened in Maxie's case. And the thing was, like, I, I think everybody, including within the Sixers, could see this emergence coming even a, a year ago. Um, and, look, you know, even his second season in the league, this is, this is, uh, this is his fourth year. So second year in a league, he's already, like, you know, 17 points per game on decent efficiency, and the, the passing is there, and you could like the speed, the burst is clearly there, and all that. But then last year, you know, he's got to navigate, you know, James Harden, and you know, and, and that had been the way, he, you know, you know, Max, that had been Maxie's kind of like. There's the security blanket of it, but there's also the lot, you know, lack of opportunity if you've got a, a James Harden. I, so I, I think, I think like uh, for me. The curiosity I had coming into the season was, okay, James Harden is gone. We've seen Maxie flirt with all-star type play, but it's different when you're now the guy. And obviously Joel Embiid's the guy, but when you are the guy with the ball in your hands as a point guard with all the responsibility that comes with it and no James Harden to share that with, um, the, the, the game is in your hands, and what do you do with that? And, and I think Maxie had such a great season. I think if, if you wondered whether he could be just a great secondary ball handler and and even like the third guy behind Harden and, and, and Embiid, could he be a, a primary um, spotlight player? I don't know that anybody really, really knew that until they traded James Harden and, and gave the keys to Maxi this season. 
Howard Beck of The Ringer is with us here on The Hoffman Show. I mean, that's the thing that's also so impressive. is like last year, like you said, he, he kind of has this moment where Harden is still there, but late in games, you're like, oh, I feel more comfortable if I'm the Sixers with Maxi having the ball. And then last night, there's Joel's not having a great night offensively. We know he's under the weather. There's a million reasons why he is not 100%. But Maxi's willingness, because there's so many guys in the league that are like, well, I'm just going to keep fill, feeding Joel. And like, I don't want to step on his toes. And you know, this is in some level a credit to Joel for having the humility to play with a guy like Maxi and be like, nah, dude, go. Um, but what do you make of the fact that he was willing to, the, the, the fearlessness and, and also the feel for the game to realize that he was the one who needed to save them? Yeah, and that's part of why when you asked the initial question about, like, did the Sixers win it, did the Knicks lose it? Like, I think it's more about the Sixers winning it and, and Tyrese Maxey, you know, seizing the moment. And it, it, it like, it, it's, it's really interesting. Like, every player, every star kind of has their own way of, of moving into these moments, right? And um, I think with Maxey, it's reminding me, in a way, completely different stylistically, but in a way of Steph Curry, where it's, there's a joy behind it. Like he smiles a lot. He's having fun. And it's not, it's not kind of the old school, like I'm going to rip your throat out. Like he did, he did rip the Knicks hearts out last night and their fans hearts out. And I was at the garden to, to see and hear that. Um, but it's, it's not in that kind of like, you know, alpha dog pit bull kind of way. It's more like I'm out here just having a great time and doing what I do best. And I think that's part of what makes him such a magnetic player and, and personality too and why unless you know even for Knicks fans and I was texting with uh, some of my Knicks fan friends last night like they were like they can't they can't dislike him they're just blown away they're impressed like they hate it but um I like I, Maxi just earned everybody's respect and I think that's the ultimate you know I was gonna be psyched about that analogy Howard is my wife because we were watching the game last night and I was raving about Maxi, and Steph has been my favorite player of the last decade and a half because of the joy thing. And she goes, I know why you like him. It's because he's like Steph. And now she's going to think that she should go write about professional basketball. <laughs> so uh, thanks thanks for that. Sure, for sure. Um, <laughs> you, you, you married a smart woman, obviously. But um, I, listen, I think, like again, like Maxi, Maxi dominates the game differently than Steph does, right? Like very, very, like they're not, nearly the same player other than, you know, they both are nominally point guards and, you know, you know, can shoot some and whatever, but like, they're very, very different. I, I just think that the way, um, the way a star player in the NBA galvanizes a team and there are different ways of doing it, galvanizes a team, galvanizes a fan base, um, pulls you in, pulls even the, in the casual fan. Like if you're somebody who just walked in the room for the first time and didn't know who Tyrese Maxey was, you'd watch and you go, yeah, that guy's really fun to watch. And it partially it's the things he can do, and partially it's it's it, the demeanor with which he does them, right? And so, yeah. like, like um, I don't know, it's just a, it's a really fascinating aspect just of 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 him, and I think of of NBA stars. Howard back from the Ringers with us. Uh, two more quick Sixers things. Um, if you know, they obviously would have to pull off three in a row here to to come back and win this series. So if they were to not do that, and they they ultimately do lose. Where does that leave them? Because Maxie's having this moment and and has proven this year of the caliber of player that he is. We know that Joel's getting closer to 30. He was having literally one of the best seasons we've seen in decades until the point that he got hurt this year. Like uh, the types of numbers uh, that efficiency wise can only be matched by those, you know, historical seasons where Wilt Chamberlain averaged 50 a game. Like that's literally how, as I'm sure you know, Howard, like how productive he was being but hurt again, and, and here we are in April, and they're on the brink of elimination. So where does that leave the Sixers if they can't pull off this comeback? It's interesting because before they won last night, and even after they won, I, there was I, a lot of like just noise I was hearing. You know, this is obviously not within the league. This is more like fans and media and others, but like, could this be Embiid's last game with the Sixers? Is this the end of the process? And I'm like, I, I'm, I'm actually a little stunned by that narrative or that conversation that even curiosity or just as a, as a talking point um i know that like Embiid has you know certainly had a, a polarizing run with the sixers and sixer fans not sure what to make of him and they may be a little split on him because yeah he's always getting hurt and then you know he makes the comments the other night about you know because the knicks fans had kind of invaded their arena and he's disappointed that the sixer fans weren't there in in, in higher numbers I've I've talked to some people um, just in, in Philly media who tell me like, yeah, there are a lot of 
Philly fans who have kind of checked out on this team or just, you know, just not sold on them. And um, it would account for why some of those tickets were available for Knicks fans to snatch up. And so I, I get it. But listen, the guy's a year removed from winning MVP. As you just noted, he was, he was actually even playing better this season. Like, he actually was improving on his yeah. MVP season noticeably and would have won a second one in a row, I think, if he'd stayed healthy. And, yes, it, it, injury racked career – and a frustrating career, but the guy's incredible. He like there's just you just don't find guys like that very often. And if you were to trade him, like there are teams that would love to have him, and I think you could probably get a boatload for him. But I don't know. I I, I haven't thought for a second that 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 was the logical conclusion to any of this, no matter what happened. Because we if they lose this series, it's largely because Embiid was you know still rehabbing from the knee. And on top of that, had the, the, the Bell's palsy to deal with. He's not nearly 100%. And the Sixers kind of held off on trying to make massive improvements to the roster because they were saving cap room for this summer. And they're going to go into this summer with Embiid, Maxi, and a boatload of cap room and a lot of flexibility to do things. Whether that means they steal Paul George from the Clippers, whether it means that they um, acquire somebody in trade into that cap room, a lot of teams this summer are coming up against it really hard because of, of the, the the new CBA and all the you know, the second apron and all this all these restrictions. Players are going to be available that teams are just going to have to like almost I don't want to say dump, but they're going to have to make some sacrifices just to deal with uh, CBA issues. And the Sixers will be in a great position to take advantage. So uh, if I were the Sixers, the, the cool headed view is I have a guy who's one year removed from MVP who is, is, you know, one of the top five to seven players in the league. I've got another guy in Maxi who's just coming into stardom, young, great, exciting. And I've got room to add around them. Like, I'm not, I'm not moving one of my stars. <laughs> like, um, so no, I don't, I don't think this is the end, but I've been wrong before. Yeah, no, I mean, that makes total sense to me. And it's the kind of thing that a guy like Josh Harris at the top would plan for. Um, and obviously Daryl Morey would plan for um, because they have such a good feel for this. Speaking of Harris, um, who obviously is of a much local interest here in D.C. as he now owns the Commanders as well, he and some of his uh, ownership partners are buying 2,000 tickets to Game 6 and distributing them to local Philly community leaders and first responders, et cetera, et cetera. Have you ever seen anything like this before, and why do you think that Harris and company are doing it? <laughs> I have not ever seen this before. I'm not saying it's never happened. It's possible, but you know, Knicks fans took over. I mean, takeover is, is a little bit strong, but pretty darn close to taking over the Sixers arena um, in game four. And it was so noticeable. I did. I was not at that game, but you could hear it on the TV and certainly the players noticed and Joel Embiid, you know, complained about it afterward. Like uh, Sixer fans, you know, looking to make a profit on their tickets, can't begrudge them. But if it's on the secondary market and New York is close enough to, you know, make that commute, but that's embarrassing for the franchise and, and for the team. And it's uncomfortable. And like, especially in a, in an intense uh, uh, sports market like Philly for that to happen. So that the Sixers themselves are buying up 2000 tickets. I'm, it's not entirely clear to me if they're buying them off the secondary market themselves to just like make sure that they're not available to Knicks fans, or if these were tickets that had been previously unsold, which Defies reason. I can't imagine, no matter how Sixer fans feel about the, the, the Sixers right now, I can't imagine that there were 2,000 seats just available. So my assumption is that they were buying them off the secondary market to preempt Knicks fans from, from buying them up. Um, and then they're going to give them to a very variety of groups uh, within Philly. So uh, smart move if you're trying to avoid having your arena sound like Madison Square Garden. But, yeah, really weird. Yeah, no, that's I, – I didn't even – when – you said the secondary market thing. I was just like, oh, they probably have some amount of tickets that they're like not selling. There's probably some weird financial thing. I didn't realize that that would be where they would go. It's like literally, look, I just imagine some person who works for the Harris Blitzer Group like being on StubHub now with a company credit card, being like, you sure? They're marked up a lot. <laughs> I I mean, that was, I could be wrong. And I did, I have not made a call. I have not asked yeah. the Sixers about this. Um, so I'm, I'm making some assumptions. But yeah, I just, I just figured it was kind of that. It yeah. Like, makes sense to me. To like, you're right. They it's a playoff game. Said, yeah. How many tickets are available? Uh, take, take, we'll take them all. Yeah. That's wild. Uh, Howard Beck with us from The Ringer. Uh, I know on your latest uh, podcast appearance, you guys talked quite a bit 
about the Suns. Uh, and I remember you know having you on last year as we were headed towards the exit of Beal here in D.C. He winds up in Phoenix, and I just was like, why would you do that if you're Phoenix? And a year later, I look very smart on that. Uh, but we are just a year in, Howard, and that's kind of what I wanted to ask you is year one unquestionably did not go as the Suns had hoped in any matter of way. Regular season, those guys barely played together, those guys, of course, being Beal, uh, Booker, and Durant. But they're obviously going to, I would assume, run it back again and see if they can be better in year two. How do they make it better, or was this a one-and-done type of experiment? The, the, the answer to the first question of how do they make it better Nobody knows. They're like no, no, no. Nobody knows the answer to that, and they're going to have to figure that out very quickly here. And I'm not sure if they can. And the reason for that is, as I mentioned earlier, the NBA is operating under a new collective bargaining agreement that went in a year or so ago, and the biggest restrictions are now just coming into effect. And when you have a payroll as high as theirs, with three stars making as much as they are, it becomes nearly impossible to use the usual methods to to uh, add more talent it's just it gets really really hard they have zero flexibility they've traded away almost all of their draft capital first to get durant and then other moves since then um they're they're really hemmed in like this seems like one of the most impossible situations i've seen and i i i think it's very very reasonable and this is not an overreaction it is very reasonable given durant's age given them being swept in the first round, given uh, everything there, that maybe this should be one and done, that maybe they should just say, you know what, we gave it our best shot, we went all in, it blew up in our faces, and the only way to recover from this is to trade Kevin Durant now. And if you trade Kevin Durant, it opens the door to Booker maybe wanting out too. But, you know, the the the, the way you'd want to go is to trade Beal, but that's a, a near impossibility. Even can confirm from no Washington, trade. Howard. Can confirm from the District of Columbia that trading Bradley Beal is very difficult. Well, and almost more so now, right? Yeah, because he still has the no team, trade clause, if I'm not mistaken. Like, that went no with him. Clause, yeah, it does not go away. They could have negotiated it out as, as part of the deal, but they didn't, which I think also was foolish. Um, so he still has the no trade clause. But I, I would say this, and I said this on uh, the Real Ones podcast earlier this week. Even if the no trade clause didn't exist, I just don't think Bradley Beal is tradable because he's making fifty million a year, and in a few years from now, he's still be, going to be making fifty-seven million. And you you just it, it, in in an ever tightening system, that same concern of having a guy making fifty something million, but who can't play more than fifty games in a season because he's always getting hurt. Like it's it just he's not. He's not worth the bang for the buck, and, and it's a and it's a multi-year deal, and it's only going higher. Like, who's trading for Bradley Beal's contract, even if he doesn't have a no trade clause? I just don't see it. I, 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 this is the worst possible time to have one of those albatross type contracts. Like, I know in the past, it's always like, oh, uh, you, you'll never be able to trade Gilbert Arenas, or you'll never be able to trade whoever, and all and these contracts always get traded anyway. I think this might be the one to to finally be like the you know, this is peak untradeable contract. I, I just, I think they are stuck with Beal. And if that's the case, and if you think that this, this trio has failed and is not going to be able to, to, you know, move the ball forward at all next year, and I don't see how they can, then you have to consider trading the other guys. No, I, I, that was my thing for Phoenix in the first place. I was like, this feels like a bad idea. And obviously it seems like there was some consternation within the organization about the fit of those guys um, and just kind of the lack of, like, it, it just, hey, let's get the all-star team together and it'll work itself out, which is typically what happens is like someone will convince themselves, but with what Brad's history has been now for years. And the other thing, and this is where we'll wrap, Howard, is kind of the state of the league is so uh, – I, interesting is one word weird is another right now where you've got this young and up and coming group of stars in Edwards and Halliburton and kind of the 25 Zion. If he can stay healthy as he did for 70 games this year for the first time, this up and coming sub 25 class and obviously Curry and LeBron on the way out who have dominated the league for the last two decades. 
And then you've got a weird middle tier where Jokic seems to be emerging and maybe maybe he wins another one and you're like, oh, well, this was the Nikola Jokic era. Why didn't we realize that uh, more in real time? And then Giannis is kind of the other guy in that, you know, anywhere between 25, 35 age group that's got a shot. And the Bucks are seem to be a disaster uh, of all kinds right now, although if they can pull this off, who knows uh, if, if Dame and Giannis can get back for a game six and game seven. But it, it just seems like there is – almost a, a weird vacuum and thus maybe not as many teams who are like, oh, I'll convince myself that I'm the, the team that can fix Brad Beal because teams are either kind of set and on their path or are, or are just kind of accepting their fates at this point uh, and maybe even rebuilding. And there's not a te- as many teams that feel like they're one piece away. Yeah, I mean, this has been an age of parody, you know, of whatever, five straight uh, champions without repeating and all that stuff. And we've got, you know, all uh, in the Western conference in particular, all these teams that seemed really close, but then, you know, the playoffs start and it's like Timberwolves sweep and granted Zion, you know, uh, or excuse me, Timberwolves sweep and then granted the Suns are, are, are kind of wonky. And then the Pelicans got swept and granted Zion wasn't playing. And um, we've had some lopsided series, but we do have a, a lot of teams, with a lot of talent where it feels really close and it makes teams, tempted i think to to make maybe riskier moves um you know it, it's I, I don't know i don't know what to make of it exactly i feel like this summer is going to be kind of a, a, a resettling a little bit where especially in the west it's going to be really hard for teams to break in to that that top group because the, the nuggets are so good the thunder the timberwolves and they're they're all young enough and under contract those teams aren't going anywhere and we've got these older teams where, you know, the Warriors are built around older players and so are the Lakers and so are the Suns, of course, the Clippers. And so there, some of this may just sort itself out and that the parody may start to like ebb and we might see more of a traditional alignment um, as guys age out, but we just have older stars who are still really effective, a lot of young talent and, you know, and it makes it tough for the decision makers because it's like, is this a year where we're supposed to be all in? Are we chasing a playoff bid? Or are we, or are we you know, like like the Jazz are a really inter- interesting position, right? Like, are they trying to keep adding around Markinen, or should they be trading Markinen and, and saying, you know what, we're not breaking into this for a while. <laughs> it gets too crowded. Let's play the long game. And I don't know. I don't know what the right answer there is. Yeah, and shame on me for not saying uh, SGA, obviously, is one of the young stars who's emerging uh, as the Thunder swept uh, and have just are on to the second round. Yeah, it's a great – it's it's a fascinating time uh, in the league and a uh, few people that I'd rather talk about it with than Howard Beck, uh, of course, with The Ringer. Uh, you can catch him on their podcast. You can read his work on their site. Uh, and was in New York last night to see the Tyrese Maxey show. Howard, always great to chat, my friend. We'll do it again here in the next couple of weeks as the playoffs march on. Always a pleasure, Greg. Thanks, man. Hey, this is DA, and you're listening to The Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey Edge.